Okay, we are back on the record. Uh, the attorneys are present along with Mr. Mew. Uh, Mr. Nelson, will you be delivering Mr. Mew's argument? Yes, Judge, but I believe the state had something to add before I start. Just, I just noted um, my total was incorrect. All the specific lengths I gave for recommendations is correct. The total of initial confinement is 70 years. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Judge. I just want to start by obviously acknowledging that this was a tragedy all around. We completely understand and appreciate the heartbreaking loss and the grief that was suffered by the Schumann family, the other victims, uh, and their entire family, their friends, everybody here in the courtroom for the most part. It's obvious that Isaac Schumann was a unique and special human being that was loved by innumerable people. As Your Honor knows, here today, defense has a unique role in this process. And so while as a human being, I definitely heard what was said, uh, I'm going to focus on our role today and I'm going to focus on uh, the galleon factors. And the galleon factors, as we all know, and we'll talk about it later, talk a lot about Mr. Mew, uh, the seriousness of the crime, and the need to protect the public. So I just want the court to know, and obviously the public to know, that uh, we heard the victims. Um, we understand uh, and appreciate that. I'm just going to move through and talk about the galleon factors. I think it's always important to, when I think of Galleon, which I think it was cited in my uh, sentencing memo, Your Honor, and I'm sure Your Honor's heard me say this before at other times. I've been in front of Your Honor numerous times. But my favorite quote in all of Wisconsin jurisprudence is from paragraph 36 of Galleon. Experience has taught us to be cautious when reaching high consequence conclusions about human nature that seem to be intuitively correct at the moment. Better instead is a conclusion that is based on more complete and accurate information and reached by an organized framework for the exercise of discretion. I know Your Honor knows that quote. I know Your Honor will appropriately exercise your discretion. I didn't mean to imply that you wouldn't, but I think it's good for all of us, and I know obviously the court, Your Honor, is my audience today. This isn't happening in a vacuum. Um, and I think it's important for all of us as members of the court system to take that real responsibility on when we speak about things of this serious nature, which at the end of the day, this is as serious it gets in our profession, in the criminal justice system, the sentencing. How do we deal with loss? within our society, within the court system, within this courtroom. It's a profound question that I think demands incredible attention, and that's what I'm going to try to give it today. That quote ends with the exercise of discretion, and in Galleon, again, as Your Honor knows, the courts talk about discretion in a way that makes clear the use of discretion is using the process of reasoning and a logical rationale. And so if you indulge me for a moment, just to quote from paragraph three, discretion is not synonymous with decision making, rather the term contemplates a process of reasoning. Paragraph six, in this opinion we examine the process of reasoning. Paragraph 19, quoting McCleary, the term discretion implies a process of reasoning. This process must depend upon facts that are of record and that are reasonably derived by the inference from the record and a conclusion based on a logical rationale founded on proper legal standards. They go on to say in paragraph 22, more about a rationale. Paragraph 39, a rational and explainable basis. Paragraph 49, a rational and explainable basis. Paragraph 15, a rationale for sentencing. Decisions must be knowable. And I'm going to address that a little bit more when I do get to the, I think, at near the end, when I address punishment and retribution. 
because um, I think this framework for us here in a court system using rationale to try, be unsuccessfully, but to try to figure out what we do as a society when loss has been suffered. And part of that rationale, Judge, is clearly morality, right? I don't want to go on too far about, you know, what's the purpose of the criminal justice system, but I think in many, many, many ways it is a system to try to impart uh, and show uh, our common morality and the morality that we believe in as a community. Um, I think morality, and I think there's hundreds of years of philosophers who support that, that essentially morality is by its nature both forward-looking and functional. And I think that's a key theme at any sentencing is we're looking towards the future. Obvious. We're here about the past. Right? There's been crimes that were committed that he was convicted of. There's loss that happened in the past. But morality and sentencing, I think, at its core is forward-looking and functional. The natural purpose of morality, even the retributive impulse, is to shape future behavior advantageously for our community, for our society. Any reasoned moral response to past behavior must consider the best means to achieve what our community's desired ends are and how most effective we can be on those future offenses. And I say that, and I, I'm maybe taking some things out of context, but one of the one of the matters that Mr. Anderson addressed, right, in his comments, and I appreciate this, that he was critical of Mr. Mew's actions on the river. And he essentially said, and I'm, you, Honor, just heard it, so I'm not quoting word for word, but what I heard him say, he was critical because according to Mr. Anderson in the state, Mr. Mew was acting on vengeance to get even. That's one of the things that the state had said. Now, I don't want to get, this isn't the time for factual disputes. I get that. So I'm going to put that aside whether I agree with their conclusion about what the facts lead to show. But what we know and we both agree upon is that's a recognition that vengeance is an emotion that we ought not promote. Vengeance is not something that we ought to model. Vengeance is not something that I think any of us should aspire to or aspire others towards. Justice is different than vengeance. And I don't think this court, any court, while the natural human feelings of those who've suffered loss may involve those very instinctual, common, emotional feelings that all label vengeance or some sort of strike back. That is not something we all agree we should promote. And my hope is at the end of this that Your Honor will have some words to address that and address the meaning of sentences and the purpose of that and how they may differ from vengeance. So back to Galleon. As Your Honor knows, Galleon cites the law, the starting point for the law on any sentence, even this sentence, and I'm quoting the law, probation should be considered as the first alternative. That's what Galleon says. It then quotes Bastion, B-A-S-T-I-O-N, paragraph 24, 25, excuse me, adopted the ABA standard 1.3 relating to probation. And again, as Your Honor knows, and maybe Your Honor will address this in your comments, but this is the framework where we as lawyers in the court of law in a, social con in a system designed by social contract that we've all agreed upon, this is the, this is the framework which we do. And it says probation should be the sentence unless the court finds that, one, 
Confinement is necessary to protect the public from future criminal activity by Mr. Mew. Or, two, Mr. Mew is in need of correctional treatment, which can most effectively be provided if he is confined. Or three, which I think is what the majority of what we'll be talking about today, I will be, is number three, or it would unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense if a sentence of probation were imposed. So with that framework, Judge, I want to talk about those three different factors, or three different questions that need to be answered. Obviously, within that, Galleon also talks about the three sentencing factors, which I think are somewhat parallel, if not consistent with that, and that is um, the character of Mr. Mew, um, the need to protect the public, uh, and the seriousness of the offense. So I'm using it in the framework of these three questions outlined by uh, the standard 1.3 of the a uh, ABA standards. So first off, um, is confinement necessary to protect the public from Mr. Mew? That's where I think we think of his character, right? And I understand that the state and some of the other speakers today made comments about Mr. Mew's character and I understand why they may have those opinions. But the facts, the cold hard facts, are that Mr. Mew, prior to this time when he was on the river, has never been in trouble. He was an upstanding moral human being. He had, uh, as you know, in the sentencing memorandum and in the PSI, uh, but just to quickly outline, he was born in Romania. He was, he and his family, uh, for lack of a better term, were treated poorly there. Things, a circumstance that was outside of his control, and they managed to leave that circumstance and come to America. But like some other things in Mr. Mew's life, that wasn't in his control. He didn't sign up to be born into a communist Romanian country. He didn't sign up to be persecuted in that uh, communist uh, regime. Um, he came here and had what I think we would all consider the American dream. An immigrant came here, he learned the language, he adopted he, uh, uh, America, he assimilated into our uh, country, uh, and he was a productive member of society, getting an education, being employed, uh, and having positive relationships throughout his adulthood. The state has mentioned some things about his character that I feel like it's, I don't want to belabor it too much because I don't think at the end of the day there's really much question about his character. The, the state's talked about his phone calls, right? What your honor probably knows is he's been in custody for two years and a day. About 732 days he's been in the St. Croix County Jail. During that time, he's had some phone calls. Um, the state mentioned some of these phone calls. I will just say without, without us being distracted by these phone calls that we dispute the translation on many of those phone calls. In particular, the word bastard. That's not the Romanian word that Nikolai used. I think the proper translation would be an unfortunate, an unfortunate. And so that's a very different context in which this was set. Second thing I think is Mr. Mew has been in custody for this time. Like I think anybody, whether he's, he was involved in this traumatic event, right? He's been suffering PTSD while he's in the jail. That's documented through the jail records, through the medical records. Um, he's been going through his own process. These phone calls that are mentioned, you don't get a timeline. You don't get a date. Many of them, based upon my memory of those phone calls, which wasn't a huge part of the trial, was these happened in the first 30 to 60 days of his incarceration. These weren't from yesterday. These weren't from last month. These weren't from around the time of the trial. These were much, much further back in time. And I say that because I, I, 
remorse is something that the state talked about, and they talked about it in the context of Mr. Mew's character. I think Your Honor knows the criminal justice system in America is good at several things. It's not really good at allowing sometimes a space for a person in Mr. Mew's position to express remorse in a safe space. The only people that he'd be able to do that with are myself and Mr. Tarofasi. I don't want to make myself a witness, but I can tell Your Honor as Office of the Court, he has processed this. He has shown in the numerous times, the tens if not hundreds of, time, hundreds of times that I've met with him, remorse over different times in the action. A lot of mixed emotions, probably not one emotion that he's been showing, but there has definitely been remorse. One story that he's given me permission to tell is very soon into this, after the uh, event, uh, the state approached me as his lawyer and asked about the release of Isaac's body. As we heard um, from his sister, uh, Isaac's body was evidence. That must be a, a devastating, devastating thing that they had to deal with. And Mr. Anderson reached out to me to see if the defense would release the body. And of course, I did my duty. And the first thing I did is I went and I spoke with my client, Mr. Mew. And when I made that question, and I approached Mr. Mew with that question, he looked at me aghast. He could not believe that that had not already happened. And he broke down emotionally and wept. He just wept. Maybe there was other things that had came in. Maybe this was a time when I first met him when we, got to, we, got, we were starting to get to know him. Maybe it's a time that this loss that had happened became more real for him. But in that moment, he showed what I think was remorse. They weren't there to see it. And they weren't there to hear about it until today. And if we could redesign this criminal justice system in a way that maybe we could give some of those things to the victim's families beforehand as we're going through this, I think there might be other healing, there might be other things that can go through. I understand and appreciate why they might feel the way that they do. But I can tell you, I've been with him. I've been with him over those 732 days, and he has shown remorse. Is it mixed? Is it complicated? Absolutely. Are there times that he has some other feelings that are all mixed in with this? Yes. But I submit to you that he has shown remorse, and it has become more and more and more so as we have moved through the process. His character, Judge, at the end of the day, we're here to judge him on his actions, right? He's here because of an action. And I think that all of us as human beings, at the end of the day, we have thoughts, we have opinions, we might make comments, and sometimes our words might be considered actions. But at the end of the day, when you add it all up, you're going to judge me, all of us, the world judges us on our actions. And this day, July 30th, that two minutes, right? We'll, we'll expand the time limit. That's the first time that he, his actions, I think, become into question. And what, in any other context, in any other context, I'm not trying to belittle what we're doing here as serious. If I, if I make an analogy that's poor, I apologize. But in any other context, if we were seeing somebody's performance across a field, whether that be in a sport, whether that be in academics, whether that be in a profession, if they've demonstrated through factual data points and we measured all of their actions and they had one data point, horrible, glaring, big red data point that's at the bottom of the scale, right? If, we're, if all of our points are measured across a scale, birth to death, and we hopefully develop and grow as we go across time and our actions improve on our <coughs> development of moral, moral development and in society, if somebody has one data point that's below that line, common sense tells us in every other capacity, in every other field, you don't overcorrect based upon one data point. And that's why I think his character, and I get that that's just one part of this, I don't want to say it's equation, one part of this analysis, but that's 
what common sense tells us and everything else. If you objectively measure it with the PSI did, he is low risk statistically. He didn't ask to take the PSI. He didn't ask to get measured on compass. But it happened, and one of the things that the compass came back and told us is he's low risk, which makes sense for somebody who's 50, Four now, at the time he was 52 and had never been in trouble before. That's low risk. That's what the objective <laughs> evidence, if you were going to use a process of reasoning or rationale, that's what that shows. The, I do think, and I don't want to, I appreciate that there's been a guilty verdict. I'm not trying to relitigate matters about what happened on the river. But I think when you think of his character, and later when you think about need to protect the public or when you think about punishment, all of those aspects, we have to, we have to consider the circumstances of the event. That's just the, the plain reality of this. And the circumstances, the factors, the conditions, the circumstances played an essential role in shaping Mr. Mew's reactions. He didn't put himself in that position. I've definitely heard talk, and I will address it later, about could he have gotten himself out of that position in other ways. I understand that, and I'll address that. But we have to know that he didn't put himself in that position. The state, I think even again, in their acknowledgement, right, one of the things that they were critical of him is they said, he should have de-escalated by showing the knife. And I'll get to that. But I think that's also just a common sense acknowledgement that somebody else, other people, the circumstances were being escalated by people other than Mr. Mew. He was in that position. There may have been other things that he could have done to do that, but it's not of his necessarily controlling, control, excuse me. So I just, again, we're here to talk about Mr. Mew, and we're here to talk about Mr. Mew's actions or reactions, and you're here to judge those, and you're not here to judge or blame others. I get that, and I appreciate that. But his actions, his reactions, did not occur in a vacuum. It did not occur in a vacuum. The second question, moving on from his character, um, to some degree, is... And again, just on a, I sent your honor a letter. There was numerous quotes from all of his family and friend. He's got numerous family and friend that are here. And some of them even asked me, could I approach, could we say something on behalf of Nick? And I appreciate why somebody would want to do that. My hope is, is that your honor, through the PSI, through the letters that we uh, that I submitted, through the letters that other people wrote and that I submitted, your honor gets a picture of who Mr. Mew is and it's while well, calling witnesses might help this process today I don't think it's going to help your honor and at the end of the day I think my audience is the court so What's the next uh, question? The next question is, is Mr. Mew in need of correctional treatment which can most effectively be provided in confinement? And I think the answer to that clearly is no. There is nothing in the PSI, there's nothing in his character, there is nothing in any of the information that's been in, submitted to the court that he has any treatment needs. There's been this potential about alcohol. I understand that, right? And one of the things that Mr. Mew uh, wanted me to point out regarding the correction from the PSI uh, regarding substance abuse history, uh, in particular pages 22 through 34. Uh, just, it's probably just easier for me to quote his words. It's not as much a correction as just maybe some things were left out. And his words to me were, I rarely drank any alcohol in college. And when I did, it was beer only, never hard liquor rarely drank more than one to two beers, and rarely until I would get a buzz. I avoided getting a buzz. I did not like beer or any type of alcohol in the beginning at 23 years old. I drank socially only. So that's, again, I, uh, it's not, I don't think, 
Nobody said that he was intoxicated on that river. The PSI acknowledges that, that that's not what the evidence was. Was there alcohol involved? Yes. Um, his, the witnesses that testified, the witnesses that submitted to him, he's not in need of treatment for any substance abuse. There's no other need that he would ha could only get in prison, right? Um, and even if there was, whatever, again, I don't <coughs> think that there's an alcohol problem, but I think it's undisputed that treatment for alcohol can best be provided in the community. So he doesn't have needs. He's educated, he's employed, he has no record, no past behavior. Um, the treatment, right? I think at some point, if we're talking about sentencing, sentencing is about modifying our attempts, our, the court system, the court attempts at modifying another human being's behavior. Right, either through moral education or giving them other tools, uh, other skills, so that they are a uh, reduced risk. In, in this situation, if you're talking about the morality, we have to again consider the circumstances of this event. We have to, right? I understand Mr. Anderson does not agree with my analysis of the verdict. There's probably never going to be an answer as to whether or not, uh, to what degree self-defense was considered by the jury or whether there's been any factual finding that he, in fact, had an actual belief that he was acting in fear. I think the evidence supported that. Um, my conclusion, as I put in the writing, was that the jury uh, determined that his beliefs were unreasonable and that's why self-defense didn't apply. Your Honor is going to be able to do that in your own context, so I'm not, I'm not trying to relitigate, but I think that that's important here because it's our position that he had a sincerely held belief, mistaken, wrong, unreasonable, but the jury found it to be reckless. This is not an intentional act that needs to be modified. The state, even though they didn't say that, their imp implication is what he did was something that's intentional. They talk about his smirking. They talk about his doing other things as if this is something that he intended. The, the jury denied that. They denied that theory. They rejected that theory. Um, this is a reckless act. And I think when we're talking about how do we modify someone's behavior, you're different than if you're modifying a reckless act than if you're modifying an intentional act. This wasn't criminal thinking. Right? This was somebody who was in a situation and, again, I appreciate this, might be, people might be, but overreacted, right? That there was a tool, he used that tool, and he used it to a degree that the jury found to be reckless. But I think that that becomes something that we need to consider, right? There's no treatment modification because he didn't act with malice and forethought. He didn't act with malice and forethought, right? He act, reacted out of fear. Uh, and while that may be criminal, that's nothing, something I think that he needs any treatment for. So again, that's all in response to that second question, right? Which really leads us to, I think, the, the core of this matter. Would probation unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. Um, I imagine your honor is not surprised that I would say that. Um, but I think we need to think about how that should be issued, right? And I say that there are what I'm afraid of in this case and in all cases. And in general, when we talk about sentencing and the, the we have to make sure it's not unduly depreciated, is that we have an entire system, right? An entire system of justice. That appreciates the seriousness of crimes. And for, I think, anyone, a PSI writer, an attorney representing the state, the public, the media, 
for anyone to try to simplify it to say that the only way in which we can appreciate the seriousness of something is a number in prison, a length of prison sentence. I think that that is disrespectful to the entire criminal justice system. I think that that undermines all the other things that we do in the criminal justice system. Because we appreciate, and this, part of this whole process is an appreciation of that. And I hope that the public, everybody understands that. There's, there's an arrest. There's incarceration. Incarceration for 732 days, which as your honor knows, that doesn't happen in most cases. Most people are let go on bond. And I'm not critical of the decision to not, but that is obviously an appreciation of the seriousness of the offense. There are numerous court hearings. There is jury selection. We went through the jury selection process in this case, through all of those questionnaires, all of those other things, to make sure that we get it right. And I appreciate the level of detail that we did, but that is, again, a way in which we appreciate the seriousness of this case, because we don't do that in all of the cases. I know that. We don't. And we should have done it in this case, and we did do it in this case, and we did it because of the seriousness of the case. Um, there was clearly a trial. Um, there's now been a conviction, right? He's now a felon. And he's going to be sent to Wisconsin State Prison System, right? Those are all recognitions of the seriousness of the offense. My, complaint might be the wrong word. My criticism, I think, is of sometimes how we do sentencing is, is that we push all of that aside and try to say, we have to do a number. Right? It's like a contest. Whoever can produce this bigger number, that's where we go to. Uh, that's not what I think we should be doing in the criminal justice system. It should be measured. It should be thoughtful. Right? It should be wise. There's, I don't think, it's not an equation. Right? It's not just simply math. And while numbers are important, we don't value lives with a number. We don't value character of people by a number. There is no way that we can put into numbers the loss that the Schumann family has articulated. And I get that. I also get the, the, the desire to try to do that. But that's not something we can accomplish. We just can't. I wish we could. I really do, as one human being to another, I wish we could. But how, again, I'm not trying to imply how they, how we in this system, we use our words, right? We use our words to explain things as Galleon things. And I think it's to explain things in a moral sense. It's too simplistic if we rely upon a number. And it undermines the evaluation and the appreciation of all the other aspects of the criminal justice system if we do that. <clears throat> Again, duly depreciate. Appreciation, I think, is about the future and deterrence, right? There are, there's no science, zero research, that any sentence that is given in a case is going to deter others. There's, it's one of the most studied things within the criminal justice system. And general deterrence, there's no evidence that that works. So while I appreciate the desire for that, that we want to do that, we want to do something here that is going to change the future for the rest of the world. I get that. That's a, that's a wonderful desire to have. But the science says that's naive, that that's not what's going to happen, because that doesn't happen. And I think it's even more so in a case where we're talking about things of a reckless nature rather than an intentional nature. And here's where I think I need to go back and address some of, the, some of the thoughts that people have about Mr. Mew, and I understand why they would have those thoughts, and whether it's the state uh, calling him a monster or evil or whether those other people, right? I don't think that that helps anything, and here's why. 
if we're really trying to craft a sentence that is going to have some influence on people watching, people who read this, people into the public, right? If the court system says he's, and I don't think the court would, I don't, I've never heard the court use name, if considers him some sort of monster or evil, it's easy. It's easy for everybody on the camera, everybody who writes this, everybody who reads about it, to other Mr. Mew, to think of him as somebody so different than themselves that this case, this sentence, these actions don't apply to me as a human being. And that's the danger. That actually undermines what Your Honor is trying to do if Your Honor is thinking about the future and whatever happens here has some sort of influence on the public. Mr. Mew was, is a good man. He was in this situation and he's been convicted of doing a crime. And that doesn't diminish the consequences of his actions. But to talk about it in a way in which we other the person who does that, I think doesn't recognize the reality of all of our vulnerabilities out in this world. All of us in different situations. And all of our also responsibilities to do what we can in different situations to either prevent and or de-escalate violence. This was not something done by a monster. This was something done because of some circumstances that lots of people played a role in. And Mr. Mew, at the end of the day, is here to be accountable for his role in that. And <clears throat> circling somewhat back to just the accountability, right, Judge, and seriousness of the case, as well as remorse. There's, as Your Honor may be familiar with, there's an author in America by the name of Michelle Alexander. Uh, she wrote a book um, about the criminal justice system uh, back in 2010. She's also occasionally writes in the New York Times an opinion, right? And I just want to quote two of the quote some of an article that she wrote back in 2009. Survivors are right to question incarceration as a strategy for violence reduction. Violence is driven by shame, exposure to violence, isolation, and an inability to meet one's economic needs, all of which are core features of imprisonment. Perhaps most importantly, according to Ms. Sarid, that's a different author that she's quoting uh, that wrote a book called Until We Reckon. According to Ms. Sarid, quote, nearly everyone who has committed violence first survived it. And studies indicate that experienced violence is the greater predictor of committing it. Caging and isolating a person who's already been damaged by violence is hardly a recipe for positive transformation. She goes on to say, in many ways, when she talks about accountability, and this is where I want to circle back to remorse and Mr. Muse being through the system, isolated and not able to have contact necessarily uh, with what we call restorative justice programs while the case is going on. Quote, our criminal injustice system lets people off the hook as they are not obligated to answer the victim's questions, listen to them, honor their pain, express genuine remorse, or do what they can to repair the harm that they've done. They're not required to take those steps to heal themselves or address their own trauma so they're less likely to harm others in the future. The only thing prison requires is that people stay in their cages and somehow endure the isolation and violence of captivity. Prison deprives everyone concerned. Victims and those who have caused harm as well as impacted families and community deprives them of the opportunity to heal, honor their own humanity, and break cycles of violence that have destroyed far too many lives. I quote from that judge because while I recognize this is a prison case, the amount of prison is clearly in debate. It's clearly something that Your Honor is going to decide. 
and how do we break these cycles? And somewhat is a cycle of mindset of somebody gets harmed and they react and respond to that harm. And we're here to judge Mr. Mew for that reaction that he had in this set in the setting that he did not set up. So what do we do as trained professionals who've had 732 days to contemplate what's the right response in a safe setting? I can't imagine a more difficult task. And I know I've heard Your Honor, if not other judges, say that sentencing is the most difficult task. But it's, it's that measured response that I think we are required to give. In talking about the circumstances of the case, Judge, I do want to address just <coughs> four points about the circumstance of the case, right? One of the things, you know, is that's been talked about in the PSI, as well as in statements today, as well as in arguments today, is, you know, walk away. I understand that, and I appreciate that. And I'm not trying to excuse, I'm trying to offer something that Gallion talks about is an ability to explain and articulate to Your Honor, so Your Honor might have a better understanding, and so I think the public can have a better understanding about what it is that created this situation. We know through the video that there was, Mr. Mew was walking away when some of the group of football players called him raper. And we know he responded to that. And I appreciate that the state's position is he should not have responded. He should have kept walking away. And I'm not trying to explicitly say disagree with that, but I'm trying to get so Your Honor might understand why a human being might respond to that. I think that those name calling, whether it's raper, whether it's pedophile, those are different than calling somebody a name that's specific to that person, right? That's just about not what they've done, but about their moral character. We've all heard the names, whether they start with an A or a B or a D or whatever it is. We've heard those names that I think lots of human beings have heard and they've walked away. When you're called something that says you have violated society's norms, society's norms that I think we would all agree, everybody in this courtroom, that it's just, it, it, it's, it's horrific, right? To be a raper, to be a pedophile who is preying upon somebody who's vulnerable, to be called that and to walk away might be seen as tacit agreement, right? Tacit agreement into those behaviors. And so I'm not saying everybody would. I'm not saying anybody should. But I can understand why somebody who's pro-social, who believes in community norms, might say, look, you can't call me that. You can't call other people that. You're breaking some norms about what you're saying, and I have to stand up to that to say, that's not okay. Not just the name calling, but that behavior that you accuse me of. It's not about the person, it's about those social norms. And that's something that I think you can't walk away of because you can't really say who cares. Somebody addresses you in that way, I think to walk away is to say who cares. And you know what? I do care. I would hope lots of people care. Lots of people would care if young, vulnerable people, children are sexually assaulted, women are raped. We should care. And a response to that kind of comment, I think, is, at its core, an expression of caring about that. That's why he turned around. It's not bad character. It wasn't an intent to harm. Then we come to the point where they talk about he should have walked away. And I get it. The one minute and 42 seconds into the video, He's standing, he's got the knife in his hand, there's two women in front of him, and there's other people that we can't see. I understand eventually we need to get to that one minute and 42 seconds into the video. But prior to that, the uncontested facts are he walks away twice. He did walk away. He walked away down the river 
to, uh, away from the group of uh, football players that were tubing. And then he walked across the river to go over and talk to the other group of adults. He did walk away twice. Appreciate that the state's position is he should have walked away a third time. I understand that. But to say he didn't walk away, I think is inaccurate. And I think the record needs to show he, Mr. Mew, always deserves to be sentenced upon an accurate record. He, in that situation, when he walked to the second time, as we've all seen in the video, he used his words. And it was shut down, and from then on, everybody has said he didn't use his words. That's what the state said. That's what some of the, the uh, people who spoke today is he didn't use his words. I understand and appreciate that. As somebody who makes their living using my words, I appreciate the value in words. As somebody who listens to courts use words to solve problems, I appreciate the value in words. That's what he could be judged on, because he didn't use words. Why didn't he? We don't know. I think he said he was overwhelmed, he was afraid, he didn't know what to say. Could it be part of the language barrier? Could it have been other things? I don't know. But I, I, I think we need to put a pin in that, use your words. What did he do then? Does the state say at the one minute and 42 second, he had a tool with him. We know he had a tool, it was a knife. And he opened up that tool and had it in his hand at 142. As the state said, he should have de-escalated it by showing the knife. I, I think that's worth mentioning because I think it's a tacit agreement, at least from a moral standpoint, if not just a legal standpoint and a factual standpoint, a moral standpoint that that circumstance was perhaps worthy of a person showing a weapon. He didn't, but I think that's to understand the circumstances. I think that's essentially a, even if we disagree with it, we might understand why somebody in that position would take out their tool, right? He had a tool, and at the end of the day, he had a tool that nobody else had. He had a tool that nobody else had, and the manner in which he used that tool is why he's here. And I think the state's position is he used that tool harshly, right? But, and I think this is the last point on the circumstances of this, but it's an undisputed fact. And he deserves to be sentenced on accurate facts. He did not use that tool until violence had been done to him. Should he have used the tool? The jury said no, right? But I think in judging his actions and judging his character, that is something that I think is you have to consider. He did not use that until it was used upon him. The appreciation obviously goes towards the PSI as well, right? The appreciation of the wrongfulness. And I say that because, as Your Honor knows, I'm not telling you anything, that there's an executive branch. The executive branch is represented by the district attorney's office, represented today by Mr. <coughs> Anderson and Mr. Smeestead. Mr. Anderson spoke. That's the executive branch. As often happens in a judicial setting, the judge, as you did here, asks other parties of the executive branch to make a report. In this case, it was the Department of Corrections. They made out a report. One of my, I guess my position, what I submit to your honor is, there's a reason we put judges in charge of this and not the executive branch. Do not, I would submit to you, I would encourage you, try to persuade you, don't abdicate your authority to the executive branch. Don't abdicate your authority to a non-lawyer who doesn't have the same duties that a judge does. We all know judges have different duties. Galleon spells them out. There's all kinds of other things that I'm, I know I couldn't even list about the duties that a judge has that are different than a DOC agent, right? They're not bound by the law. They're not bound by Galleon. They're not bound by a process of reasoning. They're not bound by a logical rationale. And I say that because I'm gonna submit here as an exhibit Yes, we'll have it marked as uh, exhibit number one I think in a moment. Probably two. I think the state had exhibit number one. Two? 
Thank you. Your Honor probably knows, I hope, uh, if not, I, I, for everybody to know, is the Department of Corrections has what we call a grid, right? They have sentencing recommendations for what should be recommended in the PSI for different cases. And it's a nine box grid. You know, on the left is whether somebody's low risk, medium risk, or high risk. And across the top is whether the matter is mitigated, neutral, or aggravated. You know, I'm going to use the term guidelines. I, they're not legal guidelines, all right? But it's certainly something that the DOC has. There's no mention of this anywhere within the PSI. Zero mention of this anywhere within the PSI. Nor is there any number on this grid that is consistent with the numbers that were submitted by the PSI. For lack of a better term, they went off the grid absolutely went off the grid. In the uh, recommendations uh, to the Department of Corrections as to how to use that grid, right, uh, there's different things about assessing the severity of offenses and whether or not something can be mitigated, neutral, or aggravated. And all of the guidelines talk about how if they're going to claim something is aggravated, they need to list the reasons why. Not quite as strong as Galleon to talk about a process of reasoning, a process of reasoning, or a rational, logical basis, but it does talk about that. And the Department of Corrections in no way justifies how they got to aggravated, if they did. I submit to you that this is mitigated. It's mitigated because it's reckless. It's mitigated because of the circumstances surrounding this that were not all of Mr. Mew's doing. And if you look at that box, if you look at the box where it says it's mitigated and it's lower risk, as Your Honor said, that's a blue box. And the blue box says no presumption of prison or probation. It's based on the circumstances. The number inside that box says one to two years very different numbers than what the PSI recommended, very different numbers than what the state recommended, but that's a process of reasoning. That's a rational, logical way to get to something. They, by, the, by they, I mean the Department of Corrections, didn't follow their own rules and didn't explain it. The interesting thing for me in Galleon when it talks about it needs to be an explainable sentence, it needs to be an explainable sentence. You need to be able to articulate it. And I don't know if this is my common experience with that, judges. I've been at times, despite perhaps my uh, verbosity today and in other times, I can't always explain things. There's been times when I've had a conversation with my wife, who's, as you know, smarter than me, wiser than me, uh, more thoughtful than me in so many ways. Uh, and we're talking about something and she'll be like, well, articulate the reasons why. Explain it to me. She'll even set me up sometimes where she'll give me time. And I can't. I can't. Whether it's dealing with our children, whether it's something else in the household, and she'll come back and be like, yeah, you can't because that's an intuition. Because that's an emotion. And appreciate all of that. But at the end of the day, that's not how we, I think as human beings, if we're mature and developed, should be making decisions. And it's clearly not what Galleon says we should be doing. We need to be able to articulate it and explain it. And if you can't articulate it, if you can't explain it, that essentially means it's because it's not rational, it's not following a process of reasoning. And I say that because all too often, and I can't recall, I don't mean to project onto your honor if I've heard it from your honor, but all too often I've heard that there needs to be punishment. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the value of punishment, but punishment is not an objective in and of itself. Punishment on its own is not worthy. We don't want anyone in the world to punish other people without some sort of future objective. Punishment is a tool. It's a tool that we use to shape the future. 
But punishment can't justify itself. And so when I've been in court, you no know, disrespect to your honor, I don't think I've heard it from your honor, but when I've been in court and I've heard judges say, well, there just needs to be punishment, that is contrary to Galleon. That is something that they can't explain. That is something that they can't articulate. Punishment in and of itself is not an end. Punishment is a means. And we know prison is punishment, right? We absolutely know that prison is punishment. <clears throat> that punishment, like I said, is not an objective. Punishment, if it's given, has to have a purpose. And because of the circumstances in this case, whatever that purpose is, I think it cannot, should not be vengeance. As I wrap up here, Judge, some of the things I want to tell you just are, we don't have the death penalty in the state of Wisconsin. And, but there are death penalty cases across the United States of America, in America. And in those death penalty cases in general, we, we ask the jury to do a duty, right? And what the jury is used, the jury's duty in that sense is to give, quote, a reasoned moral response to the evidence about the offense and the offender. A reasoned moral response. A reasoned moral response is not vengeance. Apologize. So circling back to do not, I would encourage your honor, don't abdicate your authority to the, to, the, to the executive branch. The executive branch and the judicial branch are very different. In many ways, maybe this is an oversimplification, but when I think of the executive branch, I think they speak about, they, that's who we are. This is my community. I live in St. Croix County. I've lived here for 28 years. Um, and this is my government. And Mr. Anderson speaks for my government. He speaks for who we are, who we are in this moment. I get that. I might disagree with him. But it's different for the judge. I think judges in the judicial branch, right, judges speak about who we ought to be. Not who we are, but to speak to everybody here about who, who we ought to be, right? There's a quote, if you will indulge me, that I have hanging in my, have in my office painted on a wall. It's something that my wife gave to me. Uh, we have it in our home. Right? It's a quote from a philosopher, German philosopher from, I think, the 17th century, uh, Goethe. I have come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It is my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that is, decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated and a person is humanized or dehumanized. If we treat people as they are, we make them worse. If we treat people as they ought to be, we help them to become what they are capable of becoming. Now that's an incredibly profound quote, and I hope all of us at some point attempt to do that. We can't follow through all the time. That's an incredibly difficult task, especially here today, I no doubt, Judge. But when we think of the judicial branch, we, we, not just Your Honor, the position, right? This is me as somebody who's been a participant, who went to law, who thinks of the law, the duty of the law. I, I, judges, the judicial branch, we not, don't just want people who are smart. We want people with wisdom. 
we don't just want people who are thoughtful. I think we think of the judicial branch as some place where there is measured. Not just analyst, analytical, but an understanding. Right? And I'm, I've seen your honor. Your, your honor has shown wisdom, shown measured responses, shown understanding of other human beings. And I appreciate that today it's an incredibly difficult task that your honor has. But let me end with this. Your honor is the only one here with a tool that nobody else has. Your honor has the power to send another human being to be in a cage, to be in prison. We ask that whatever your honor decides today, that you are measured, you use your wisdom, that you are understanding and that you perhaps craft a sentence that gives the community what they want, but also here under Galleon, allows Mr. Mew, allows Mr. Mew the opportunity to get back out and live some period of his life, some time in which he can perhaps do some of the things of accountability that we talk about that I think are going to be more meaningful than a number. <coughs> so, in the end, Judge, I appreciate that you have the tool of prison. Please, use your words, not the tool. Mr. Mew, this is your opportunity to make a statement or, if you wish, to offer any reason why I should not impose a sentence today. Would you like to make a statement? Judge, he's written out a statement to me. I had it in hand. I printed it just for easier. I think he wants to read it, and then I'll submit it to the court, so it's just a part of the record. Certainly. Mr. Mew. Dear parents, family, and friends of Isaac, I would like to I would like to start by letting you know how deeply sorrowed I have been. I am, and I will always be, for the real fact that Isaac is not with you anymore, and that and that I was directly involved in his very tragic and unimaginable death at such an early age. I never meant for this tragedy to occur. My soul is broken. My heart is very heavy. And I will never be the same carrying such a heavy burden and sorrow. I pray to God for forgiveness, compassion, and love for everyone affected directly and indirectly by the outcome of this tragic event. I'm hoping that you appreciate how much I'm sorry for the outcome of those events. I'm very sorry. So we'll have that marked as Exhibit 3, Judge. That'll be received into the record. That's all then from the defense, Judge. Mr. Mew appears today in court for sentencing. Count one is first degree reckless homicide, which is a class B felony. Uh, with the dangerous weapon enhancer, the maximum possible penalty is 45 years of incarceration, initial confinement, and 20 years of extended supervision. On counts two through five, Mr. Mew appears for sentencing on first degree reckless endangerment. Class F felonies with the dangerous weapon enhancer. The maximum possible penalties are 12 and a half years initial confinement and five years of extended supervision. Uh, last count six is battery. Uh, that is a misdemeanor. Uh, with the dangerous weapon enhancer, he faces a maximum possible sentence 
of 15 months. Uh, in preparation for today's sentencing, I reviewed a number of materials. Uh, first, I reviewed the uh, pre-sentence investigation report prepared by the Department of Corrections. It's a 43-page report that provided me with uh, information that I uh, knew and information that I did not know about Mr. Mew, about his victims, families, about <coughs> Mr. Mew's background, about all aspects of this case, many of which were talked about today. Uh, that PSI report also included a sentencing recommendation. Uh, I also reviewed Mr. Nelson's uh, sentencing memorandum. Uh, it, it was very helpful. Uh, it provided uh, more information about Mr. Mew and his background, uh, and I valued uh, that information. Uh, Mr. Nelson uh, submitted uh, numerous letters from Mr. Mew's personal friends and coworkers. Uh, I read all of those. I also read the relevant portions of the file, including the complaint, the jury instructions, uh, and the verdict. In a moment, I will pronounce a sentence that I believe is just and fair. Uh, when deciding on a sentence, I must consider the gravity of the offense, including the effect on the victims. I must consider Mr. Mew's character and his rehabilitative needs. I must consider the need to protect the public. Uh, the sentence must be based on the facts of the case and the law, not personal considerations, passions, or prejudices. But judges in Wisconsin have a great deal of discretion when imposing a sentence. Uh, unlike many jurisdictions, we do not have sentencing guidelines or grids to follow. I want all of you to know that I have given this case a great deal of thought. I take my responsibility seriously. Uh, there is nothing more difficult or more solemn than imposing a sentence on another human being. As far as the gravity of the offense, the jury has spoken. Any efforts to relitigate this case are simply without merit. I firmly believe that the American criminal justice system is the best ever devised. It's not perfect, but I cannot think of a system of justice that is better at finding the truth while preserving the rights of the accused. In this case, 12 jurors reached a unanimous verdict. These 12 jurors were selected from a panel of more than 150 people. I, along with the attorneys for both sides, chose these jurors because they could be fair and impartial. The jurors came from all corners of our great county. They came from all walks of life. They were men, they were women, they were young, they were old. They listened to eight days of intense trial testimony. They examined dozens of exhibits. They deliberated for eight hours. In the end, they reached a unanimous verdict and found beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Mew was guilty of reckless homicide, reckless endangerment, and battery. Now, there are two key takeaways from this jury's verdict that I want to mention. First, the jury rejected the state's claim that Mr. Mew intended to kill Isaac Schumann or the surviving stabbing victims. In other words, the jury rejected the most serious crimes that would have sent Mr. Mew to prison for the rest of his life. Second, the jury rejected Mr. Mew's claims of self-defense. That means Mr. Mew did not reasonably believe that he was preventing or terminating an unlawful interference with his person, or he did not reasonably believe the force used was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. This jury found Mr. Mew guilty of reckless homicide and four counts of reckless endangerment. These crimes are serious. They mean that Mr. Mew did not think about the consequences of his behavior 
and that he showed utter disregard for life when he stabbed five people. For that, he will be held accountable, but the court sentence must reflect the reality that it was reckless conduct that the jury found him guilty of, not intentional conduct, which is punishable much more harshly. In weighing the gravity of the offense, I consider the impact these crimes have had on the victims. Uh, the battery to Madison Cohen was unjustified. While she did not suffer any permanent physical injuries, she has mentally suffered over this entire ordeal. Uh, she described to the PSI author uh, the toll this case has taken and continues to take on her. This offense has devastated Isaac Schumann's parents and stepfather. No parent should have to endure the loss of a child. Uh, they have had to cope with the senseless death of a loved one while enduring the weight of the criminal justice system that can be slow, confusing, and sometimes frustrating to victims. Uh, to you and to your family, there are probably no words that I can say today that will alleviate your grief. But I would be remiss for not expressing my sincere condolences to all of you. I am sorry for your loss and what you've had to endure. Although it must have been difficult, I appreciate each of you speaking today and sharing a glimpse into Isaac's life and who he was. It sounds like he was a wonderful person, bright young man who had an unlimited future. And for that, we in this community have lost. A.J. Martin and Riley Madison would have died on that riverbank had it not been for the swift action of law enforcement and EMTs and other tubers who helped to treat their wounds and stabilize their condition. Uh, they had long hospital stays, but they were very fortunate to receive high quality medical treatment that restored their health. But we heard from them about the toll this matter has taken on their health, their mental psyche, and their prospects for the future. Anthony Carlson and Dante Carlson's were, wounds were less severe, but the risk to life was still present, obviously because the knife was directed into, into their torso near vital organs. Uh, but they fortunately have survived. Each of the surviving stabbing victims suffered permanent physical disfigurement. That can't be overlooked. And we've heard from uh, A.J. Martin, and just about how that disfigurement can affect one's life. In assessing uh, Mr. Mew's character, I must consider his conduct on July 30. Uh, Mr. Mew's crimes were the product of circumstance, not intent. Mr. Mew was not looking to cause trouble or hurt anyone, but he made a series of very poor decisions. When confronted with words and boorish taunts and insults, uh, Mr. Mew drew a knife and he struck Madison Cohen. That quickly culminated in senseless, lethal violence. He left the scene, leaving his victims to die while casually floating past them and emergency workers as if nothing had happened. He nearly reached his car. He nearly escaped the jurisdiction before law enforcement arrested him. These are terrible acts that form an indelible stain on his character. The 
There is more to Mr. Mew than his worst acts. I can tell Mr. Mew has taken this case very seriously. He has been appropriate and respectful in his demeanor in court. I sense that he carries a heavy burden too. I imagine he is disheartened at the prospect of prison and the uncertainty of his future. But I also sense that Mr. Mew feels genuine sadness and remorse for what happened to his victims. I agree with the comments earlier that our criminal justice system is not designed in a way to allow people to apologize or to alleviate grief or to show respect to victims until a day like today at sentencing. That is unfortunate, but I, I heard Mr. Mew's words both today and before, and I, I think he is sorry. Other than his conduct on July 30, Mr. Mew appears to be a, a quiet, nonviolent, peaceful man. He's never been in trouble before. Uh, he is loved by his family and friends. He's generous with his time. He helps others who are less fortunate or who are in need. Mr. Mew is respected in his community. Uh, several of his uh, personal friends and coworkers submitted letters that describe his character. Uh, those letters were not shared in court today, but some of the most common words they use to describe Mr. Mew are kind, compassionate, friendly, loyal, respectful, and honest. Mr. Mew had to overcome great obstacles in life to achieve his place. Uh, he and his family uh, suffered at the brutal hands of the communist regime in Romania. When he was a teenager, he and his family fled. They found asylum in the United States. Here he adjusted to a new country, new language, new culture. He got good grades in high school. He went on to college in South Dakota. He became an engineer. He worked hard. He had a successful career. I read somewhere uh, in my materials that the proudest moment in Mr. Mew's life was becoming an American citizen. Mr. Mew has no rehabilitative needs. That means he doesn't need rehabilitation. He has no past criminal history. He does not associate with criminals. He has never used illegal drugs. He is not an alcoholic. He has not been diagnosed with a mental health condition, although there is evidence that he's experienced PTSD from July 30 while in the jail. Mr. Mew is educated. He has vocational skills. He has life skills. He's financially secure. He has a stable home. He has positive social supports. He knows the difference between right and wrong. He doesn't need rehabilitation. I mention all of these things to acknowledge that there is a, a lot more to Mr. Mew than what he did on July 30. I mention these things to recognize that a fair and just sentence takes into account the complete person, not just his worst acts at his lowest moment. Despite the seriousness of Mr. Mew's crimes, the evidence does not show that he poses an imminent risk to the public. Mr. Mew underwent a compass assessment, which is an actuarial tool that measures a person's risk of committing future crimes. <clears throat> 
Not surprisingly, Mr. Mew scored low risk. He's not a career criminal. He's not a violent predator. Although Mr. Mew may not pose an imminent risk to the public, the public does have a strong interest in holding people accountable who breach the social compact and commit crimes. It's the concept of punishment. Punishment is a sentencing objective. When a person commits a serious crime, that person forfeits rights enjoyed by the law-abiding community. The most restrictive punishments are reserved for those who commit the most serious crimes. The punishment exacts a toll on the offender because of the harm the offender caused to the victim and the community. Taking life and endangering the lives of others are two crimes that warrant significant punishment. Punishment for what Mr. Mew did, but also punishment that recognizes who he is and the circumstances of his crimes. Here, that punishment will involve the loss of liberty because anything else would depreciate the seriousness of his crimes. So at this time, I will impose the following sentence on Mr. Mew. <clears throat> For count one, I will impose a term of initial confinement of 20 years followed by six years of extended supervision. For count two involving Anthony Carlson, five years initial confinement followed by five years of extended supervision. Count three involving Dante Carlson, five years of initial confinement followed by five years of extended supervision. Count four, Alexander Martin, six years of initial confinement followed by five years of extended supervision. Count five, Riley Madison, five years initial confinement followed by five years of extended supervision. Count six, Madison Cohen, 270 days of jail. Uh, Mr. Mew is not eligible for challenge incarceration program or the earned release program due to his age and the nature of these offenses. The sentences on all six counts will run concurrent. I am opposing a concurrent sentence because Mr. Mew's conduct toward each of his victims was part of a single continuous act over a short period of time. The periods of confinement take into consideration Mr. Mew's entire behavior, not just the behavior directed at any one particular individual. The conditions of extended supervision will include the following, uh, maintain absolute sobriety, uh, no possession of drugs or alcohol, he shall not enter any establishment where the primary purpose is the sale of alcohol. This will include places like bars, taverns, liquor stores, beer tents, and the like. He must complete an AODA assessment. He must comply with all recommendations of the Compass Assessment and the Department of Corrections. He must pay court costs and DNA surcharge on each count. He must submit a DNA sample. Uh, he may not have any contact with Isaac Schumann's family, including Alina and Donnie Hernandez and Scott Schumann. He may not have contact with Alexander Martin, Riley Madison, Anthony Carlson, Dante Carlson, or Madison Cohen. He is responsible for restitution. Uh, the state must submit its restitution demand within 30 days. The defense may have 30 days thereafter to object. If there is an objection, the matter will be scheduled for a restitution hearing. Because Mr. Mew is convicted of serious felonies, he may not possess firearms. He may not possess body armor. He may not vote or hold public office until his civil rights are restored. If he were to do any of those things contrary to law, he would subject himself to additional criminal penalties. If he violates the no contact orders, he may also subject himself to additional criminal penalties. Does the state agree on the credit calculation, 732 days? Yes. All right, 732 days credit. Uh, Mr. Mew is remanded to the custody of the sheriff uh, for delivery to the Dodge Reception Center. 
there anything else for today, Mr. Anderson? No. Mr. Nelson? No, Judge. All right. Thank you all. You stand adjourned.